Welcome to Daycare Chronicles 101, and I am your host, Miss Tanya. Not at all whatsoever. I ain't got time for that. Hey everyone, this is Miss Tanya. This episode is going to be with my special guest, Miss Megan Sweet. She is a podcaster herself. Megan focuses on self-care, mindfulness for you. She's known as the Awakening Educator um, (laughs) on her YouTube channel. Her website is Mm your3eyes.com. I I just can't wait to get into this. The Awakening Educator. I really, really, really love that, especially from someone who's been in daycare for it'll be 31 years this year. Wow. When you reached out to me about you know, self-care and mindfulness, that is what providers need right now. Absolutely. COVID has done its job on all of us. And as providers, family daycare providers, we've been open this whole time in California Mm. because we're considered essential. Family daycare never shut down. Center-based, some child care centers did, but family daycare, we have been there from the beginning. And so- I've done a couple of podcasts on and Zoom meetings on just, you know, self-care. But I want to hear what you have to offer to our community because there's not just one way to do things. And so I just want to get right in here. Self-care and mindfulness for anyone working with kids. So right. welcome, 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 Megan. I am yeah, so thank you. Happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And um you know, I was, I have, I should say, first and foremost, hats off to daycare providers and folks that work with young kids because you. we all have our niche. I like middle school aged children, which most people do not, but that's my special niche. But when I get around little ones, I enjoy them, but they are exhausting. So I'm much more used to, you right. know, the moody teenage energy than I am the young energy. So, yeah, um, so much to, to keep young kids um, engaged and occupied and they like to move around a lot. And so yes, huge, huge. Yes. Shout out. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. So what can you offer or suggest or advice that you can give to us? Because when I tell you that on a daily basis throughout the day, at least four times out the week, I have to go and pray. Like, Mm -hmm help me get through this because there's so much more that's on us. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. as providers, we already don't take care of ourselves like we should. We're taking care of everybody else. You know, the daycare, our homes, our family, our husbands, our wives, whatever we have. Mm -hmm. But how important is it for self-care for an individual? Yeah, I think that's, it's so counterintuitive to us that are in like a giving profession to give to ourselves. And it's actually absolutely essential. So hopefully by the end of us talking, folks will not only have some ideas, but also have permission and be relentless about taking care of themselves. So maybe I'll give you like a quick kind of brain science. I promise it won't be too like because I don't know all the right words in terminology, but a quick kind of explanation about why it's important. So we have what are called like neuro mirror neurons, but basically what that means is that we reflect back the energy of the people that we're in front of and around. Mm-hmm. So, and, and we all do this and we do this subconsciously. We're not even aware of it. But like if we walk into the room and someone's in a bad mood, we might not necessarily get in a bad mood, but we are alert and aware that that's happening and we are paying attention and whatever our response to that kind of energy will start to show up. So if we kind of pull back when someone's in a bad mood, we'll unconsciously kind of pull in a little bit that makes us like feel combative. It's that whole mm-hmm. fight, flight, freeze mode, right? Whatever our responses to that energy will start to show up. So first and foremost, if we're working with kids and we're not taking care of ourselves and we're walking in and we're feeling tired or feeling overwhelmed, that energy is communicating out to other kids. And it's actually making our lives more difficult because when we're dysregulated and we're overwhelmed, we actually make our kids more dysregulated and overwhelmed as well. Unintentionally, it's the the worst punchline around being an yeah. educator because we're like always working so hard. And the more we work, actually, the harder our job becomes. Mm-hmm. So first and foremost, permission and necessity for you to take care of yourself so that when you're more regulated, you help the kids feel more regulated too. Because if if you walk into a room and you're in a bad mood, people pick up on that 
Same thing yes. if you're in the space and you're calm and you're centered, the kids will entrain to that also. And they will reflect that energy as well. So you want to be, as and this isn't a guilt trip from when we have bad moods, but more like <laughs> the more we can actually be resourced, the better we're able to do our jobs. We know that already, but actually the more effective we are at our jobs when we're there. So there's research yes. with older, like with elementary school age teachers who have shown that they're better at classroom management. They're better instructors. They're better at all those things when they practice a little bit of mindfulness, which is basically just being grounded. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, permission to take care of yourself because you need it. So that, right. that was my first thing to say. Right. Yes, we absolutely do. And I even speak to so many providers that don't take days off. They don't take vacations. Nope. And I mean, I've been taking vacations for the longest because I know that you need to rejuvenate your mind, your body, your soul. You mm -hmm. don't need to get burnt out. But some providers like my clients need me. They don't have anyone else, you know, to care for their children. And so you kind of get that guilt trip from the parents. But mm -hmm. at the same time, if you don't take care of yourself, then your body will eventually let you know in one way or another. Yeah, one way or the other, you, you pay back. <laughs> so either doing it on your own terms in a way that's going to be fulfilling for you or your mm -hmm. body will start to shut down. And I've done this to myself. I think that's the trick when you're in a, in a profession like this where you have folks that need you and you do feel so relied upon. And we are. Yes. But, um, when we don't take care of ourselves, it really just does just work against us in the end. So it's just, I know it's hard to step away. And I always used to say to my, I was a principal for a while. I used to say to my teachers, I'm like, the, the building won't fall down if you walk away. Like you're, I know you feel like you're holding things up yes. and the building will stay standing while you, while you go on vacation and take a few days off. So, you know, cause when we don't take that time to refill ourselves and just be replenished, then we don't have anything left to give. And right. No, said, I absolutely agree. One way or the other. That's the bottom line, and it's hard, and it's hard, especially when we're um, providing child care for other essential workers, and this year in particular. I mean, that's huge, because not only are you just already supporting kids, but also putting your health and well-being on the line while you are doing it, and that's highly stressful and so important, but also just scary. Um, yes, no, very, very scary, very, very scary. What would you recommend for, say, you're in the classroom or you're at your daycare, you're at your center, and you just get that anxiety feeling? So many people are starting to get anxiety now. And so you have that anxiety feeling, are you feeling overwhelmed? What would you recommend for someone to be able to do within that, like when it's happening right then and there? Yeah, that's a great question. I like something called a three three breath micro practice, which is basically just stopping and breathing for, for three breaths, okay. <laughs> which generally we can do even in front of other people. Right. Right. But it's really just, it's connecting back into your breath and just taking a breath and just pausing mm -hmm. for a moment. You can still stay in the same room. The reason why I like it is because when you're an educator, you can't always just step away and mm -hmm. go on a walk or whatever. Right. But usually you can stop and breathe for a few moments. I think even modeling that for the kids is really great. Even just saying out loud, I need to take, I'm, I'm feeling anxious. I need to take a few breaths and just, yes. and just stopping and breathing slowly. The kids will see that you're doing that. It gives them, you know, the cueing to do that as well and how to do that. And just allows us even three breaths will get us back online again and help us okay. to get recentered. So I think that's really helpful and, and three intentional breaths, not three mm -hmm. breaths while you're Right. Yelling for the kids to sit down, but really just pausing, you know, maybe standing yes. back against the wall or something so you can still see everything, but three breaths so you can get yourself back on track. I think it's really helpful. If you are a, like somebody who gets a lot of comfort from your body, you know, maybe it's even just doing a stretch, just something that kind okay. of breaks the rhythm of, of okay. what you're thinking and whatever you're doing will help you to get reset again. Okay. That sounds Sometimes when I'm doing those three breaths, I'll ask myself what's most important right now. <laughs> so I'll take two breaths just to get myself settled and on that third breath. I'll ask myself, all right, what's most important right now. And I just listen to that. So maybe it's, I, you know, cause especially when there's chaos going on, <laughs> like, what I need to I do is attend to this that. thing in the corner. Yeah. I love that. What's most important right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. I really, really love that. I do yoga with the children 
I did yoga works for about 19 months. So I just do what I know with them. But we do um, meditation with them. There's so many things that are on YouTube. And I noticed that even the children were stressed out. Absolutely. You know, they're really stressed out. And so when you mentioned the breathing, even my one year olds, that you know, they're taking deep breaths and we're, you know, sighing it out and whatnot. And so when sometimes the behavior you know, needs to come down a notch, then we will just freeze and we'll just take a minute to do that. And so to be able to do that as an adult and know that it's OK, you're modeling the which the behavior which you just spoke about, you know, to bring ourselves back centered and the children see that. So then they get a better understanding too. OK, this is OK. And some of them would just do it on their own, you know. Mm -hmm. So but I really like the what's most important right now. Yeah, really helps because especially, yeah. you know, usually our minds are stuck with so many different things or we start to kind of panic, you know, and sometimes it's about like, I'm mad at my partner and I want to like, you know, who, whatever right. it is, but like, how yeah. do I get myself back here in this moment? I do it a lot when I'm meeting with adults too, which works really well because you can get people are triggering all over the place. So if I'm in a meeting and I'm feeling myself getting pumped, like amped up, I'll be like, okay, what's the most important? Like, what's my, why am I in the space? Okay. Um, how can I re my, reset myself for what my intention is? Generally, my intention isn't for someone to see me get angry and lose my yes. lose my cool. Yes. And if that's what's happening, then let me at least catch that part um, and try and remember why I'm here. Because then it helps me to refocus, maybe let go of the person who's irritating me or whatever it is. So I think it's a really helpful just question. Yes. It's like rising above emotions. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, but mm -hmm. when, when you're in the thick of it, it's like, okay, that question right there, what's most important to me right now? Let me rise above this so that, I, you know, I don't act a fool up in here and people see me. People see right. a different side of me, you know, mm -hmm. like, let me bring this down and, you know, let me just contain myself. Definitely, you know, rising above emotions. Mm -hmm. And right now, everybody is just emotional with COVID. Everybody's emotional. There's, you know, and it's going to be a while, I think, before folks come back from that, even though the world is kind of opening back up again in some ways. We all spent a year, more than a year in quarantine yes. and have lost community members, family members, yes. you know, connections. Yes. And it's not going to just go, you know, just because we can eat, eat inside a restaurant now, which if you're in California, like I am, we, yeah. we've been the most restricted, yeah. right? So like, yeah, that's actually not going to take all those things away. So it's going to be, take some time. So I think also just giving ourselves permission to know this can take a minute and it's going to take our kids a minute to get themselves caught back up again and to recover from what happened, like reforming those social bonds. If you've had the kids, they've at least have been having that, but Mm -hmm. I'm watching my son who's 12. He just started back to school two weeks ago and he doesn't know how to be around other kids anymore. Like he has to relearn all of that. Yes, 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 absolutely. And what I'm noticing with even the parents that come in, they're so overwhelmed and disconnected from their own children. Mm -hmm. Like they, mm -hmm. a lot of parents didn't know what their children's interests were or what their children liked until quarantine hit. And then you're like, OK, so this is who my child really is. So the daycare wasn't lying to me when she said my child was like this. You know, a lot of parents were just because everything is so fast, fast moving. But quarantine definitely allowed um, families to to really get to know one another again. Yep. On a personal everyday level, you know, and I noticed that within the daycare community, as providers, it's pretty solitary anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was even more solitary, you know, because you really like you couldn't even go out on a field trip and see maybe see another provider out or take mm -hmm. the children, you know, to the zoo or to do anything. So when I say the mental health is of us as providers, it's this conversation is just definitely, definitely needed. And I just respect you so much for, you know, for agreeing to do this. What other little tips can you give us? Like a lot of times on the weekends, providers were just grocery shopping, we're at home goods, we're at Target, you know, like how much amount of time would it take for us just to kind of get back in tune with ourselves, not so much focus on that, like, because mm -hmm. that's our lives. That's all we do, you know? Right. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, you know, the way I define mindfulness is just being in the present moment. So you're just 
in wherever you are doing whatever you're doing. And you're just, your head is also with your body. So often our, our brains and our heads are totally disconnected from our bodies, right? Our, we're thinking about something that happened in the past or yeah. is going to happen in the future. And we're not actually in our body at any time. So really mindfulness is just like having the head and the body being in the same place at the same time, which, you know, is actually harder than it sounds. And I think often people think when they, if they have to develop a mindfulness practice, they need to go off and they need to sit on a cushion for 20 minutes or an hour and they need to be all, all blissed mm-hmm. out and peaceful. And that's not realistic. It's certainly not realistic for me. No. Right. And, you know, I'm a single mom and I'm in, you know, I work a lot. And so that's, you know, I don't have that kind of time. And so I think people don't invest in mindfulness because they think it's going to be this long-term thing that they need to spend a lot of time in. I believe you can accomplish it in five minutes a day, pretty easily doing what you like to do anyway. So the first thing would be remind yourself something that you like to do. That's just for you. So even the things that Mm -hmm. you're naming were sound a little bit like chores, which is the same thing I do on the weekend, right? I'm like, well, I got to do the grocery shopping and, you know, all the stuff. After we get off the phone, I'm like, I got to get my mom's, my mother day present. So like all that, right? That's how you, that's how we spend our time. Right. But if we can find even just five minutes doing something we like, and they can be, it can be one minute spread out five times during the day. That's okay too. It's just an intentional reset moment. So it could be sitting on the, I have a little patio at my, apartments, maybe sitting on the patio for a few minutes, just enjoying the feel of the sunshine on my face is a really great way for me to be mm-hmm. back in the present moment, or maybe yes. going on a walk, or maybe it is target. I have a colleague who loves target. That's her treat. So maybe that's <laughs> <laughs> So being unapologetic about that and taking right. a little bit more time to look around and just enjoy being a target. Yes. All those things fill us back up again, help to fill up our buckets again. If you have a really hectic home, maybe it's just like spending an extra minute in the bathroom. No one knows what you're doing in there, but you have one more minute for yourself in the right. bathroom. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. simple. It's, it's So it's just those things. I, I recommend always doing things that just bring you joy because that just is a boost. So anything that makes you happy, again, even if it's just for a moment is enough, I'll do it at stoplights. So that's instead of checking email or texting someone or doing yes. all the other things that I try and do, I have now just trained myself just to breathe at the stoplights with my eyes open, obviously, because I have to see in the right, light. Right, of course, office. right. I just breathe at the stoplights. Okay. And I notice my impulse to want to do other things. I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just sitting at the stoplight. That's what I'm doing right now. Yes. Um, that's enough to actually have a huge difference on your life. So those small moments. Simple as, simple as that. Add, okay, simple yeah. Simple as that. Because it's, it's telling yourself, that you are worth it and you're worthy of some time and attention and energy and you're intentionally giving to yourself something that you haven't been giving before. So it's that it's giving yourself that little gift is just as important as the moment itself because it's showing that you're, you're seeing yourself and you're recognizing that you need something and you're giving yourself it. So it doesn't have to cost any money. You can certainly do meditation, things like that. I think that's helpful when you have the time, there's lots of free, apps and things like that, like Insight yes. Timer and other ones. And they have, you know, you can have a timer for one minute. You can do that on your phone, but they even have guided meditations that are mm-hmm. five minutes long or, or yeah. so that it's not a long period of time necessarily. It could be just doing some yoga stretches. It's really mm-hmm. whatever is going to make you feel good. That's it. Right. My sister has the Peloton bike and she's just yeah. a fanatic about it. So I've been waiting on the tread the new tread to come out because it's smaller. But Peloton, I've been doing their meditation in the morning, like five minutes, but they they have just the best guided meditation. So this is all was all new to me. And I really enjoy it. And it gets me started on my day. Mm-hmm. And if I need it throughout the middle of the day, I, you know, I, like you said, I'll take the deep breaths or whatnot. So it's just the simple things it doesn't even have to cost anything. You know, no, yeah. I think we get it. We make it so complicated in our minds and we, we get this idea that it needs to be really complicated. I will say with meditation, what stops most people from doing it is they think that they're supposed to have a quiet mind and they're supposed to, you know, we all right. imagine like these monks sitting off yeah. on the mountaintops or whatever. And that's the opposite of what's true, right? So right. what's true is our minds by design are meant to wander. So just knowing that that's true, mm. so expecting to have a blank mind you're going to you're going to hit failure every time. <laughs> Their whole thing is meant to wander. That's what our minds do. Yes. So let's not fight that. 
What meditation <laughs> is, is just simply the practice of coming back to that present moment. So remember I said that our heads mm-hmm. and our bodies are often mm-hmm. disconnected. All meditation is, is catching ourselves when our mind is wandered and coming back to the present moment. And that's all you're doing in meditation is it's attention practice. It's not Zen out, yes. you know, blank mind practice. It's attention practice. So, oh, my mind wandered again. Yes. I'm off in a story. Let me bring myself back. And maybe you can only stay back for a few seconds before your mind wanders again. Right. That's okay. It's the practice of when you bring yourself back to the present moment, then you're able to catch up on what's happening for yourself as you're moving around your day. So all you're doing is coming back to the present moment coming back to the present moment. That's all meditation is. Yes. And I think you often end up feeling better because mm-hmm. actually there's lots of studies that show when you're in the present moment, you feel better. Even if it's a yeah. painful thing you're experiencing, you feel better than yeah. when you aren't. So that's all that is. I think that's the other thing I always try and tell people is it's, yeah, the blank mind thing. And yeah. The, yeah. And you described what I thought of meditating like spot on. Like you have to be quiet. You can't, your mind can't wonder. You have to, and I'm like, I have a thousand things running around in my head at one time. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to, to come back and just quiet yourself sometimes. Like, I just need a moment. Like, put the phone away, put the computer away. You just need a moment to yourself, not a distraction. And that well, does. You're already pretty mindful, I think, because you know when you need a moment. So yeah. you've, you've clearly been practicing mindfulness, yeah. which, even if whether or not you knew it, because that's actually what I think often as educators, we don't know, right? Mm-hmm. We're so caught up in other people and in doing and in holding and managing that we lose sight of what even what what, what we need. And we don't figure it out until it's already too late, right? We've already right. <laughs> yelled at the kid yeah. or lost our yeah. temper or whatever yeah. happens in, in the classroom or in the daycare facility. You know, we just, you know, we got frustrated. Yeah. Before that happens, if we can catch like, oh, I'm feeling frustrated. I need to take a moment. That's what we need to start to build the mm-hmm. capacity to do. And that's what mindfulness and meditation help us to do. So if, if we're trying to be mindful and we practice meditation, we're more able to catch up with ourselves in those moments and slow down the reaction time <laughs> so that we can actually right. catch it before whatever our reaction is, is out of the gate. So that's, that's why mindfulness is helpful also for us in the classroom or with kids is yeah, there's a famous quote that's by a man named Viktor Frankl who studied this and basically says, basically what meditation does is it gives us more space between the stimulus and the response. So whatever is getting us upset through meditation and mindfulness, we can stretch that time between whatever gets us triggered and our response. That same moment of time just feels longer and it gives mm-hmm. us more choices in between there. So, yeah. so that's what we want to do. I definitely agree with that. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about the Awakening Educator. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So the Awakening Educator is my podcast that I have with a co-host. And we would love to have you on there, actually. So maybe I can book you on the show. Okay, good. We'll We'll do do that. We'll start there. So we talk with folks that work with kids. And the intention of Awakening is just that I think as educators, we always have opportunities and need to continue to grow and learn and develop our craft and become more aware how to be better and stronger and more supportive to our kids, right? Like, so it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's never an arrival. I don't feel right. like as an educator, we always have something new to grow and learn. So that's the intention behind the title. And the show is we interview different educators about things that are true and important related to education. So we tend to focus on K-12, although that's not exclusive. It's just been more mm-hmm. that's our world, where our world has been. Yes. So for the first couple of years, we explored topics in detail. So we would, like we explored immigration and what was happening at the U.S.-Mexico border yeah. um, and shining a light on that. We did a series on that and we've done a series on nutrition and mindfulness and other things. So we just explore topics. So that was what we did the first two years. This year, we're just having individual conversations with people that are in the field, because just like what you named, we're finding that as educators have navigated the pandemic and have been in the world, they have really important stories to tell about what their lived experience has been over the last year and how they're navigating this moment. So this Mm -hmm. year, our whole season is just individual stories with people talking about how they're navigating educating youth in this time. So- Lots Great. Of different conversations. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. And I, I just thought of, she's not a provider. She has her own company. Her name is Lowena. She has the excellent breakfast company. And she talks about how food and behavior go together as well. Oh, totally. She is yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, well, I'd love her. I'd love her contact information. Yeah, I mean, yes. that was one of those things that I didn't appreciate until I became an educator, how essential food is to how we take care of kids and yes. especially food insecurity and how that impacts our mm. students. I grew up in a food insecure home, but I just didn't, mm. I didn't see, so I knew what it was like for me, but I didn't know mm -hmm. what it was like for our students and how much it impacted their learning. And it definitely helped me understand myself a lot better yeah. as an adult learning about food insecurity and why it's so important. Yes, absolutely. I always do like a healthy snack tip when I do the podcast. And so today I just wanted to highlight something simple because it's summertime, you know, spring, summer, a simple parfait. Nice. A simple parfait. You put it in a clear little cup for them and you put your fruit on the bottom, your your yogurt. I use Faye yogurt, you know, and maybe add a little Cheerios or granola on top and then another layer of fruit and then maybe a little honey for those that are over one drizzled on top. <laughs> and the children just love it. It's colorful. They can see it. And it's just it's a good, healthy snack for the children, opposed to all the yogurts in the packets that have all the sugar and the high fructose corn syrup. We have to stay away from those things, you know. So and even as as providers, we have to do better for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We cannot just grab the chips or the cookies or, you know, a soda and all that. We have to be mindful of what we feed the children and we have to be mindful of what we put in our bodies because a lot of things that we may eat will make us sluggish, will bring us down. You get very irritable as well, just like the children do. So mm -hmm. this all is like full circle. It all goes together. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I are so quick to abandon our bodies and, and I do it too. And you're right. Really thoughtful. It's another great mindfulness practice of just noticing what you're putting in your body and when you're putting things in your body. So are you eating because you're hungry or out of habit? Right. Is what you're eating going to help you feel better or worse? How do you know? Um, and just starting yes. to pay attention to that and giving your body what it wants because it knows what it wants. It knows oh, what absolutely. It listen to it. No, absolutely. And you spoke of, you know, doing things that make us happy. So I garden. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me so happy. And it teaches patience as well. And you're pretty much you have to be it teaches mindfulness as well, because That's when awesome. you're out there, it's typically you, the earth, your plants, you know what you do in the water. It's that moment to where I always see the God factor in gardening. Because you have to nurture what you're planting. You have to get the soil together. You need the sun to come down. You know, you need the rain or the water. To, I love when it rains in Cali, which isn't that often, but that <laughs> does so good for the plants in the garden. And it's just such a thing. And to see the bugs that are necessary, you know, you get to see the butterflies that come. You get to see the bees. You know, you may even see a few wasps that you're trying to stay away from, but they all have a purpose, you know. Mm -hmm. And so gardening is another thing that I've been trying to, you know, get other providers to do and other families to do, even if it's just a pot. Put mm -hmm. a plant in a pot and let the child do that or you do that. Everybody says, I don't have a green thumb. I don't either. You don't have to. Because mm -hmm. when you put something in the ground and you're watering it, God does everything else. You get the sun, you know, and as long as you're you're taking care of it, it will grow. And it's so, a, that's a great mindfulness practice. It's one of, it's one of mine and oh, good. And actually, this is a, a, it's a multiple one. I was going to say two for, but it's more than that because yeah. actually touching the soil has a grounding effect on us. So it actually helps mm -hmm. to restabilize like the kind of the electrical system within our own bodies by touching the earth. We get okay. healed. Yes. And in Japan, they actually have they call it forest bathing, which is basically just walking in trees. So just being in nature is a part of the national health system in Japan. So it's oh my goodness. really been shown like hugging trees and being in nature and gardening has a yes. lot of huge impacts on us, as well as something that you named that you didn't call it this, but I, I would call it like gratitude too, of just like the appreciation yes. of, of how many different plants, animals, the sun, water, yes. insects all are required for something like a plant to grow yeah. and just helps us to see the interconnection we have with other, with other people and things, yeah. which in this time is helpful. So I think 
any place where we can see our interconnection with anything other than our four walls of our home, big deal. So yeah. So what I'm getting from you is that basically we do practice mindfulness on a daily basis, yes. whether we realize it or not. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We do it all the time and it's just making the choice to do it. And if we can, doing it a little bit more often. We have to allow ourselves to do this and not feel guilty about it. Exactly. Yep. As it's- women and mothers, we're just that way. We're just giving period anyway. And so a lot of times when we do things for ourselves, there's a little bit of guilt there, you know, mm-hmm. like, but we deserve all of that. And we deserve all yeah. of that. Yeah. And if for no other reason, if we remind ourselves that we're going to be better mothers, care providers, everything else, if we do it, then if, you know, if we can't do it for ourselves, which I would love that, that if we could get to that point, (laughs) but if we can't, at least we'll know we'll be better and more effective at our jobs and in our roles as parents and caregivers. If we take care of ourselves, it will, it's been proven to be good for us in those places. Yes, absolutely. I I totally agree. I'm looking at my notes that I had on you. And one of your things that you speak on is why educators self-work and self-compassion, why educators need to focus on self-work and self-compassion. Yeah, I think it's, it's, so I, I talk a lot and focus a lot on, on equity issues in education. And so for Mm -hmm. me, when I talk about that, it's a lot of what we've talked about before. But the other reason is a very real and important one. And I'll say it as a white identified educator. And there it's, that's the majority, especially in mm-hmm. our K-12 world. People that look like me are not always a match to the students that are coming in the classroom. And actually increasingly more so, there's more kids from the global majority than there are white identified kids in our classrooms mm-hmm. and schools. And there's a, you know, implicit bias and white supremacy and racism yeah. are real and big in this country. Yes. And I believe that self-compassion and mindfulness, it's actually also been proven, helps to unpack implicit bias and helps to create safer and more inclusive classrooms and schools for the very same reason that we've been talking about. That if I can start to be aware of, oh, I'm having and it's hard to do, you know, because we're giving mm-hmm. people and none of us want to acknowledge that we have right. biases or anything right. else. Right. But we all live in the United States, which means we are all influenced by the media and by yes. the images that we've been receiving since childhood. So it's there. Yes. What we need to start doing is start to acknowledge it and make a different choice and act differently in that moment. So when I name for you like that stimulus and response, got to pay attention to the stimulus and ask a question for ourselves. What's my impression right now? What's my thought? And can I make a different choice? Yes. Um, And it's been proven to start creating classrooms that feel more safe for kids, because I think often what happens in our classrooms is, you know, a lot of microaggressions for kids that actually have that same fight, flight, freeze response. So Mm -hmm. if you experience a microaggression, if you experience a classroom where your culture and identity aren't respected or included, then actually it shuts down your learning. Yeah. Um, so we as educators have to, I think doing equity work is the most urgent work we have as a country and definitely as educators. Um, and I can only really speak to K-12 because that's my, mm-hmm. my worldview, but that's a very, there's lots of clear evidence that that's what we need to be working on. And so mindfulness helps us with that too. And I think the self-compassion is important because if we can have some compassion for ourselves, not to excuse having the thought, but like, oh, this mm-hmm. is painful. <laughs> yeah, I have to acknowledge something in myself that's painful and hard and something that I don't want to have be there. Then I think we can actually meet it a little bit more effectively and start to change it. So that's what that's about. Absolutely. I love all that. And I definitely agree with it. The other day I had a meeting with providers on Clubhouse and I was saying how the children that we have because of the climate of the world and everything that's going on right now that we have such a large charge on our head so that we can instill the good values in these children. Cause we keep children from every background, you know, mm-hmm. if whoever rings that doorbell, whoever calls, you know? And mm-hmm. so we have to instill good values, teach them to be kind, you know, the mindfulness, Definitely teaching the children that as well, because we don't know what they're dealing with when where they live at. You know what I'm saying? And everyone says, oh, all children are the same. No, all children are not the same because all children don't go through the same things. All children don't have the same background. However, 
It's nothing to teach to be kind, to teach a child how to be non-biased, to teach a child how to be anti-racist. Absolutely. I'm saying that from the time we get them, you know, by the time they're one, you know, Mm -hmm. before they even get to kindergarten, you can see some things in children at very young ages. Absolutely. Well, and actually it's crucial at the age that you're talking about. So developmentally, we go through these stages where our beliefs and our core values get locked in. And again, Mm -hmm. this is where like mindfulness and other things are important because we just have to start paying attention to what gets locked in there. We don't choose it, but it gets given to us, right? So up until age seven, children are the most impressionable of any age. So, Mm -hmm. so your community has an incredibly powerful influence on students and their self-conception. So how they believe and see themselves Mm -hmm. and how they believe and see other people. So teaching anti-racist thinking and how to be inclusive and how to be, you know, supportive of, of each other and of not being biased is absolutely crucial at that age as well as helping kids to have a positive Mm self-concept because kids are also picking that up again. Like, you know, kids are sponges. We all know that they're picking up all those messages from the media, from society that are saying things that are often really negative and damaging. So when we as adults that the kids care about and, and believe are talking to them and we help them to feel good about themselves and believe in themselves, Mm -hmm. that's also a powerful has a yeah. powerful influence on kids. Yes. My husband is a high school teacher. So okay. it's, you know, he gets to see the innocence of the ones here. And by the time they get to high school, you already know you mm-hmm. are who you are for the most part. And a lot of times the damage has been done in trying to undo that and build up the self-esteem and the self-confidence. Like I see low self-esteem in two-year-old. Yeah, absolutely. And just like, why is this two-year-old? But it's there and you can see it and recognize it. Mm-hmm. So you never know what's happening when they leave us. However, we're going to be the best that we can be for them while they are here. Right. And I yeah, definitely it's, love it's that. Being intentional about how yes. affirming we are. And yes, I know it's hard. Look, I, I said, you know, I would try to be the best teacher I could be. And I messed up all the time. So I think there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves. So, but all we can do is just be the best person we can be every day and try yeah. our hardest and, yes. and learn and grow. And those messages we send to kids, they are listening. And so we just need to be really aware that they're listening to us and, yes. and we can influence how they see themselves. And that's a, that's a huge opportunity. I really, really love the equity issues, the the self-work and the self-compassion. And that's just a wonderful thing. And the fact that you recognize that there was a need for that and that you speak on that and that you teach that. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. If there was one thing that you want to leave for the family daycare community, Mm -hmm. you know, about the importance of self-care, what would you say? Love yourself. Love is the key. Love yourself and you'll love your kid. You'll be able to love your kids even more. Thank you so much. I have enjoyed yeah, this. You. I will make sure that you get a copy of this. Oh, May. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. I will get you the information on the excellent breakfast company. Thank you okay. so much for all that thank you do. You. Yeah. Thank you. Likewise. And uh, yeah. Have great. a good one. You too. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. Listen, everybody. That interview right there was just amazing to me. I am so happy that Ms. Megan Sweet reached out. Please go to her website, yourwhileyouare, the number three eyes.com, and just see all things that the Awakening Educator is all about. Absolutely. This is Ms. Tanya, and remember if you don't want to be a chronicle, don't do it. <laughs>